.NET 7 is here, and today I'm gonna to break down my favorite seven features of .NET 7 in case you're looking to see what's new no matter what type of application you're developing. So tune in. Hey everyone, I'm James and .NET 7 just released a few weeks ago and a lot of people have been asking what's new, what's in .NET 7 for me based on what type of application I'm building. Well, there's tons of stuff built into .NET 7 that I'm gonna break down today. Now there are great blogs and videos from .NET Conf and all sorts of good stuff. So what I wanna do today is just break down my favorite seven features of .NET 7. Now these may be maybe some of your favorite features, maybe they're features you never heard of, and you're like, well, that's really cool. Um, but also maybe you have some other features. But to me, I was going through the release notes. I'm like, these are really cool. I wanna break them all down. Some of the things we're gonna demo, some we're gonna look at blog posts, but let's get into it. All right, first things first is the .NET 7 release blog. It's right here telling you how to get all of the goodies right there. Now, as you scroll down, you're gonna see all the different enhancements, no matter what type of application you're building, whether it's ASP.NET Core, .NET MAUI, WinForms, WPF, the other services like Orleans or Entity Framework Core, there's great blogs to dive into, but you can break down and go and go and go through all this good stuff. Now, let's talk about my favorite feature of .NET 7 first, which is performance. All right, when it comes to performance, there's tons of performance improvements, and there is literally hundreds of pages, all right, yeah, literally hundreds of pages for you to read through. Stephen Tobe every single year breaks down performance enhancements in every single update of .NET 7. And look at this table of contents, whether you're considering JIT, GC, reflection, interop, threading, regex as link, file IO, compression, JSON, cryptography, analyzers, and so much more. Stephen breaks down every little thing that you could possibly want to know. The best part about upgrading to .NET 7 is that you just get a bunch of stuff, right? If you're just using code, your apps just get faster. So this blog will break down anything. In fact, if you print it out, it's over 255 pages in PDF, which is crazy. Now that's just one of the performance blogs. In fact, there's other ones, including what's uh, new in performance in ASP.NET Core 7, for example, talking about all the different benchmarking that's in there from server requests, all these other things and even one for Don and Maui. So if you're looking to see what's new, Jonathan Peppers breaks down all of the goodies. So all sorts of things from just like scrolling, for example, but they go down the different lulls per second, caching values, dark mode things, all sorts of little tweaks and optimizations that they made for you. All right, next up for me is all about new server features in ASP.NET Core with rate limiting and output caching. All right, for a second here, let's take a look at an ASP.NET Core web API, the one that's sort of just out of the box. Here we have weather forecast and we have weather forecast cache. Now these are the exact same API here with a map get mapped right here. And what we can see is that they just go and return a random set of data coming from it. And if I open up the Swagger UI, you'll see both of the gets here. And when I try them out, I can just simply hit execute and it'll return back the data. Now note here, whenever I hit execute, it's different data that comes in because it's going to be different every single time. It's not cached at all, right? So here's two amazing features of the ASP.NET Core runtime that have been added. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is actually come up and we're going to add this rate limiter feature. You can set different rate limiting policies here. I just took this one from the documentation, which is a fixed policy. It allows four permit permissive calls basically um, to the API within a window of 12 seconds. And there's also a queue limit and a queue processing order as well. So that's gonna enable you to do some rate limiting there. The other one here is output caching. So you just add the output caching service here, and then to both the apps, we're gonna use output caching and add rate limiter. All right, cool. So the first thing here, imagine we want to add rate limiting to the first API. All I'm going to do is say rate limiting and I'm going to say require rate limiting of fixed. All right. Now, if we notice up top here, I named the policy name fixed. So you can have a bunch of different policies in here. All right. That one's good. Well, how about output caching? What if I just want to output cache every single time? So I'm not going and, you know, randomly generating new things all the time. I could set different caching policies. Well, all I need to do here is say cache output and that's it. 
Now let's go ahead and restart this API and two big changes are going to happen. The first API is going to be rate limited for us. And the other one will be cached here. I'm going to go in, I'm going to say, try it out. I'm going to hit go, 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 and see, I am rate limited and it's going to wait to return that back for me automatically for over that 12 seconds of time. And it will return here, but it's going to be rate limited, right? So I go again. I'm gone here and then boom, the fourth, fifth time that I'm in there, I rate limited it down, which is really neat, right? So automatically it's going to handle all the rate limiting for me. Now, still again, if we go and tap on this, we're going to notice that we're getting different temperatures. There's balmy one more time. We get chilly now. Now, if I go down to my cached API, I've added that cache on there, right? So here, if I go ahead and hit execute, I'm going to execute, I get balmy. Balmy, 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 balmy. And I can do that as many times as I want and it's going to automatically keep caching that data back for me automatically. And you can configure all the different caching settings and rate limiting features and a link to the documentation. All right, speaking of APIs, another one of my favorite things is the optimizations to minimal APIs. All right, when it comes to building APIs, I love minimal APIs. I just think it's the way of building APIs. Now I have a .NET 6 API over here and I've generated out this monkey endpoint. So I have this monkey data over here. It simply has an ID, a name, a location. If I go into the endpoints, we can see that it does things like it does a map get, uh, it does a with name, it has produces over here. And this is using an entity framework to get that data back. But if we notice, I have to do map get and do API monkey map get API monkey ID, map put API monkey ID, and then same thing for my posts and my deletes over and over again. With .NET 7 and minimal APIs, there's a new grouping feature. Now this can all be scaffolded for you. So here in Visual Studio, I have my .NET 7 API right here. And what's gonna happen is I still have my monkey that we saw earlier. I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna right click and say, add scaffolded item. And I can say API with read, write endpoints unit using entity framework. Now, this was the same thing I did earlier in the .NET 6 project, but here I can go ahead and select my monkey. I'm going to add the endpoint class that'll be generated for us, a new data context. And here I can decide to use tight, uh, open API, which is really awesome. And then also the typed results. So this is a new feature in .NET 7. So I'm just going to hit add here and it's going to install all the NuGet packages, everything I need for me automatically. And I'm going to generate my new API using grouping. So you could of course do this manually, but I'm going to let visual studio scaffold it all out for me automatically, because why wouldn't I want it to do that? Right. We generate code. That's what we're talking about. Here we go. Building project. Awesome. And now I have my monkey endpoints. Now, what I want you to note here is that this is going to look a little bit different than the monkey endpoints before here. I still have my map gets, for example, but notice this line of code right here. It's going to say routes map group API monkey with tags of monkey. Now what I can do is do the map gets over here. Just say what the end of it will be and it will automatically append that on to the group. So we have the map put here, same thing. We also have the map post, the map delete. It's just a little bit cleaner when creating these APIs. And I also love that by default, it puts in a different folder. If we go back into that program CS file, we can scroll down over here and see how this added all of it just with one simple line of code map monkey endpoints. And just like that, you're able to add these new features into your application and really make your APIs easier to create than ever. Now we're talking about creating things and new APIs and classes. There's tons of new language features of C sharp and F sharp that I'm absolutely in love with. With every new version of .NET comes new language releases and versions and awesomeness. So there is C Sharp 11 and F Sharp 7 readily available, ready to go. Frank and I recently covered a bunch of these awesome features in Merge Conflict, our podcast that comes out every single week. So I'll link to that episode over here. However, let's break down some of the cool new C Sharp 11 features that I absolutely love. Now, nullable types are really fascinating, right? So this was introduced in C Sharp 10, I want to say, 9, 10, something like that. And basically, you could say, hey, this thing can be null, right? Here I'm saying that this really can't be null. So it's giving me the squiggle here and it's saying I really need to make it nullable or initialize it or do something. The nice thing about this nullable type is it helps sort of the, um, the IntelliSense engine and the Rosin compiler do some really cool things. So for example, this normal monkey I'm returning 
is totally fine. I've set all the different data properties. Here, this monkey is not fine, right? Because I have a name, but I have no location. Now, the location can be null, so it's great because I've set string in the question mark that it could be null. It's automatically going to say you didn't set the location, so it totally is null, and it's going to give me this squiggle, this little, you know, little helper here. So I could say location, I can say, you know, South America, for example, and it's totally good. That squiggle goes away. If we go back up, though, this name is something I really want to be required, right? I don't really want it necessarily to be null. So some of the workarounds that people do is they'll set it over here to like null, and then they'll add this little bang to say, you know what? It's totally never going to be null. Trust me, it's totally good. However, if we were to remove this, for example, what we can see is that it totally lets me construct it just fine. There's no issue here. So in C Sharp 11, you can require fields. And here I can say public required string name. And now look at this. The monkey says that the required member of monkey.name must be set via the uh, object initializer or attribute constructor. So now if I say name equals, oh, name, I'll just show you this first, right? Check this out. If I just say, uh, if I come in, let's try it one more time, Visual Studio, there you go. Name, it says required. And all I got to do now is say baboon. And now just like that, that squiggle goes away. So that's really cool. So having the ability to set those as required, you don't have to do any of that, you know, work around for the Rosin compiler, things like that. You're totally good to go. So now you can live nicely with the required and the nullable types as well. All right. Another thing that's very fascinating down here is that I have this capuchin monkey that says capuchin monkey, which it totally is a monkey and an exclamation mark. And I've had to escape string these here. If I run this console application, what's interesting is that it totally gives me these like little escapes, which is totally what I was going for. Now in C sharp 11, there are raw string literals. So for example, I don't want those in here, right? How do I actually make these things go away? Because the quote, is what's telling it that this is a string. Well, you can create a raw string literal with three quotes in front of it and three quotes at the end. Now, anything inside of it will be a raw string that will be output. So now when I run this application again and I output these monkeys, look at this, sure enough, Capuchin monkey is right there with the quotes. So that's really, really neat. Now, what's also cool about this is it also lets you escape different new lines too. So you can do something like this. This is really neat, right? So if you're doing JSON or HTML, it's going to be really helpful. So here I have the raw, I have the three, I can put them on new lines and none of that stuff will mess up at all. And it'll output just like that, which is super duper neat. All right. C sharp 11, F sharp seven, all sorts of good stuff. Let's talk about containers. Now, if you're doing any cloud native development, you are going to need containers and images and all that good stuff at some point. Now, one of the neat features in .NET 7 and actually kind of in .NET 6 is that there's been tons of improvements to native ARM uh, support. Uh, the team over at Canonical has been working really close with the team here at Microsoft to make some new images and make things uh, even chiseled and smaller. So the chiseled Ubuntu containers uh, images are really small. In fact, 50% the size, nearly down to 100 megs for an ASP on a core application. And additionally, uh, .NET is in the box of Ubuntu. So you can just go sudo apt install and then boom, you're totally good to go. Now, another one of my favorite features though, is that actually creating containers is built in to .NET publish. So let's say I have this great API here. Normally you need to right click, you need to add Docker support, orchestration, all this other stuff. You need to Docker file, not anymore. You can come into your CS proj and all you need to do is add this package, Microsoft net build containers. When you do that, it's going to enable basically .NET publish for containers. It'll also work with right click and publish too. You can add a bunch of overrides and a bunch of really cool things on top of this, uh, but by default, it'll pick the right defaults. So all I'm going to do here is go into my PowerShell and I'm going to run .NET publish release Linux x64 publish profile, just my default container, and I'm going to self contain it. Now, when I do this, this is going to publish. So it's going to do a restore. It's going to do a build and it's going to do a publish just like we would normally suspect. However, one thing that we're going to note here is that it's going to build an image called monkey API seven with tags 1.00 on top of the MCR image of the .NET runtime, which is kind of amazing and really, really cool. So this is going to then 
make it register with whichever sort of a container hosting service I have running. And there's a bunch of different ones. And you might have Docker, for example, you might have something else. Here we go. It's on my Docker daemon. That's cool. So I actually open up Docker over here. We can see that I have this image that was just created. I can go in and I can actually run it, add some options. So let's add a post host over here. So I'll say eight, six, five, one. I don't know, just a random one. I'm going to say run. If I go over to my containers, it's totally here. And now what I can do is open it in the browser just like that. And now what I'm going to do is go over to Swagger. Boop. And now we have Swagger. This is running inside of a container published via .NET Publish. And here are my weather forecasts. I can try it out. And boom, just like that, it's totally good to go. So really, really awesome being able to build those images for containers all right from the command line. I'm kind of talking about actually creating smaller, more chiseled applications something that's really neat in .NET 7, which is native AOT. Now, native AOT is actually an evolution of Core RT, which was an evolution of .NET Native, but basically think of it like this. It's a way of compiling up your application fully ahead of time compiled, so it's free of JIT, no external dependencies, anything like that. Now, I have this monkey console application. That's where .NET um, um, native AOT is um, supported today. And all I've needed to do is go into my CS proj and say publish AOT. Now, if you're coming from the Xamarin and our .NET Ma Maui world, AOT has been around for a long time and it's been around for other .NET things for a long time. But this native AOT feature sort of is the next evolution of that. Once you've added that there, we can go in and just say .NET publish. Here, I'll just do a win x64 release mode and publish it there. This is going to build it up. It's going to go through a full ahead of time compilation, um, generate native code. And the best part here is that what this will give me is an XE that can be run on any x64 Windows machine at all. So for example, I can now go over run monkey console.exe, and this will be super duper quick, right? Boom. Boom. It just says hello world, and we're totally good to go. Super quick, all right there. If I open up that folder, what we're going to notice here, let me go and see this here, and we zoom in, is that this XE is only three megabytes. That's it. I can click on it, open it, and just like that, it's ready to go. And I can put that absolutely anywhere on this machine. Of course, I could create a command line for Linux or Mac or anything like that where .NET runs. All right, finally talking about AOT, let's talk about .NET MAUI. When it comes to .NET MAUI, there's all sorts of good stuff for developers in .NET 7, including tons of performance enhancements. Now, what's really great is David breaks down the entirety of the blog talking about, hey, you know, .NET MAUI was released in .NET 6 just six months ago. The tooling is done with Visual Studio 2022 17.4 and Visual Studio 2022 for Mac 17.4. They've added tons of new features into this release, including context menus, right clicks, pointer gestures, all sorts of really great desktop enhancements. There's initial support for maps, which is really cool. So you can automatically place pins, draw geometry on top of it. They've also done tons of performance, like I talked about. So tons of enhancements to collection view, rendering objects, and tons of really, really goodies inside of there. And the best part here is that it's super easy to upgrade. In fact, you can easily go in and just simply create a new .NET MAUI project inside of Visual Studio or Visual Studio 2022 uh, for Mac, and you can just say .NET 7. All this will do will simply enable you to upgrade and switch over here from .NET 6 to .NET 7. That's literally it, and you're totally good to go, which is awesome. Now, another great awesome thing that you can do if you want to see this in action is head over to the .NET YouTube. You'll see right here .NET, in, .NET MAUI in .NET 7, which is there. And additionally, you'll find all of the .NET Conf videos. So I want to make sure you see that every single thing is available. You can deep dive into everything you want. I love these state of sessions. There's state of .NET MAUI, state of ASP.NET Core, state of Azure and .NET, including the keynote as well. There's new, it's new in C Sharp 11. So many good things inside of here. So dive through hours upon hours of content. That might be one of my new favorite features of .NET 7. It's all the great things from .NET Conf.
All right, well, those are my favorite features, some really cool things. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, I want to make sure that um, you let me know what your favorite features are. What did I miss? Go down to the comments below and let me know what your favorite features of .NET 7 are. Or if you're like, yes, these are all of them, what are your favorite C Sharp 11 or F Sharp 7 features as well? Love to know what you're digging in these new releases. Let me know in the comments if you enjoyed any part of this video give it a thumbs up over here. And I will also have all of the links in the show notes below to all the release blogs, all the goodies, and all the .NET Conf videos. So definitely check those out, including a session that I did on Blazor Hybrid with my good friend, Elon Lipton uh, from the Blazor Hybrid team. All right, thanks again, everyone. Don't forget, if you did like it, jam that like button. And if you like any of this content or the things that I do here, maybe, you know, if you think about it, we you want to, hit that subscribe button so you get notified every single time I put out a video. So until next time, thanks for watching.